Hi, I'm here because I've been having a problem with my Ben Eater breadboard computer that I built. Um, specifically, when I would use the, the toggle between uh, program mode and run mode, I would have problems where sometimes, and you just saw it right there, sometimes my memory would get overwritten with whatever was on the bus or what have you. Um, and this was driving me nuts trying to figure out what was happening. And even if I program it back in, enough toggles between the two and you see a, a lose it right um i couldn't figure it out and uh, the, what i did isolate it down to is somehow happening in this uh 74 ls 157 this uh switch between the two inputs where it's switching between uh the the program write um i'm sorry the ram write signal uh from either the the manual button or the the clock signal that's coming in from the from the the clock in, in in combination with the uh the ram in control signal there um but you know as you can see from when i you know after i program it and i switch between the two um my clock's not in run mode and even though that I, i'm switching between those two that ram would still get overwritten what I did isolate it down to is when I'm doing these switches, you know, if I want to program it again, when I'm doing these switches, momentarily, when, when it's switching between the A and the B, uh, an input, this 74LS157 um, would send a, uh, basically a ground pulse out, out uh, or a low pulse out. Um, keep in mind the way it's designed that these uh, these two inputs are in there normally high, so it's an active low signal that we're sending into the the, the RAM right uh, right there, um, and so these sig inputs are normally high, and they when they are taken low is when you're supposed to write the RAM, but as um you know here here I put it high in order or put it the signal's high. Uh, is it going in there, but when I when I press the button, it's pulled down low by this wire here, uh, and, and and that sends a low signal into the into the RAM right to kind of read what I have in the dip switches and set it. But when I'm switching between the run and execute, nothing's changing in these signals. They're both high, um, and so you know why would it randomly? Well, it's not happening now for some reason, but uh, yeah, there it goes. Um, why would it? Why would that somehow toggle low? Uh, you know, it was a mystery uh, until, you know, I posted on Reddit in the, the Ben Eater uh, subreddit on Reddit uh, and uh, asked a question and a Reddit user named Doc Lazy, he actually gave me an insight uh, and explained to me, uh, gave me an insight as to why this is happening um, and pointed me in a direction how to solve it. So why don't I take a moment and explain uh, the, the, in detail why this is happening. And it has to do with the logic, the way this 157 logic uh, gate ray is set up. Okay, so here we have the logic diagram for the 74LS157, which uh, allows you to switch between, you know, to an A put, input and a B input to kind of get a result. And the way it works here is you have the select signal coming in and the select signal immediately gets inverted and sent down to, you know, these AND gates, these three input AND gates that um, take both the select signal, uh, one of the inputs, and the strobe. Uh, since we've tied that strobe, uh, I believe we tied it low so that it uh, goes into this always high. We can effectively ignore this third one, and, and really the, the issue for us is between how the this, this select line interacts with uh, these two things. So let's focus on this A and B uh, input, A1 and B1 input. So what happens is, what's, uh, you know, in, in the natural state of things, so that, like it was originally designed, the A the A input rests at one, like the, the, the static state is that it has a one input and a one input. And the select statement could be either, either way. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and say the select is uh, starting off at zero. Um, now what happens here is this inverter immediately converts it to a one and that one goes up into here. And so you have a one and a one going in here and a one coming out. Now on this B, on the B line, you have, um, it gets the inverted of the inversion. So this is zero. So this B line comes into a one and a zero, uh, which means this is a zero coming out. And thus what's coming out this, uh, what's coming out the, the, the OR gate here will be a one, right? And when you switch between uh, zero and one here on the select, since they're both at rest, um, 
at, at, at one, uh, so to speak. When you switch between uh, the select from a zero to a one, this gets inverted and basically you're getting the one signal here from either source. So, you know, ostensibly, you know, as I indicated, when you uh, do the select, switching from this one to that one should always result in a one here. So you never should see that zero pulse. But the reality is, um, these gates here, all of these gates, there's a there's a little delay in, in, in the way they act. Um, and, and that is, it takes a certain amount of time for the information from this side of the gate to get to the other side of the gate, to get to this gate, and then go through that gate and get out. For the purposes of discussion, I don't know like what the exact sign, amount of time is, but for the purposes of discussion, let's just assume they're, they're five, five nanoseconds. You know, every single one is five nanoseconds to get through, right? So when this is set to zero, and you're in this state that they already described. And let's just say I, uh, I, I, I changed this zero to a one, right? I changed it to a one. And so it's gonna take five nanoseconds for this one to come here as a zero, and that changes to a zero. So that's five so nanoseconds. But then let's just assume the wire transmission's in instantaneous. So in instantaneously, this here is now a zero. Um, and so that means uh, you know, five nanoseconds later, uh, this will become a zero. The problem is that in order to switch over to this, B, uh, the second ion gate on the B line, it takes another five nanoseconds for this zero to then be computed to a one. So this one, this gate here is changing to a one, uh, five nanoseconds after this uh, gate here changed to a zero. So there is a period of time, a very short period of time where these gates are both at zero, and thus this OR gate's going to output a zero. And that's where that zero pulse is coming from. You know, that, 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 that's the subtle thing. Now, the reason it doesn't happen all the time is that, you know, there, there, there's some, I'm sure there's some uh, variation in the timing of these things on the scale of nanoseconds. You know, we're dealing with quantum systems here. So I'm sure there's, you know, things from temperature to the earth magnetic field that kind of varies it just enough that it doesn't always happen or that the pulse, the zero pulse that comes out of here is just so fast that uh, uh, the downstream, uh, the memory um, write signal doesn't actually, it's not long enough for it to detect it. So, you know, that, that's why it doesn't always happen, but that's how it happens. It's just that this gate delay here causes a very brief amount of time where both of these are zero. So how do you fix that? You know, um, one of the suggestions that was given to me on Reddit is that what you could do is create a low pass filter uh, on this output that would basically filter out any signal that has a frequency higher than, you know, whatever threshold. You would have to design it to uh, to be, you know, using the right capacitor and resistor to kind of do it to get the right frequency of threshold that kind of crosses it out. Um, I realized, though, that, you know, that that's a, that, that's kind of, you know, the person who suggested to me even said, you know, that's kind of a hack. And so I didn't really want to go down that approach. And I thought, well, what would be another way? Well, this whole problem comes from the fact that, you know, when this whole LS157 is in the, its rest state, like the, it's just a standard state, um, that we're inputting ones. And then when you switch uh, the select, you know, there's a state where, um, you know, the, the, these AND gates are both, negative, they're not anding, you know, and thus put, 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 putting out a zero, uh, and, and so see, thus you get that low pulse. Um, what if instead, you know, the, this whole 157, you're using it where the, the, the static state or the rest state, as I've been calling it, is actually at a zero instead of, uh, of a one, you know, what, what would you get when you do that? So if we start off with, uh, you know, a zero here and a zero here, um, again, I'm going to start off with a zero select, which goes to the one and zero. Um, what would happen here is, uh, you know, you have a zero here and a zero here. So, of course, the AND gate is going to be zero. And, and you have a, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is a one here. You have a one here, but the AND gate is still going to be a zero. And here you have a zero and a zero. And the AND gate is going to be zero, and that's going to order zero. Great. Um, if I come in and I switch this select to a one, because I'm switching the switch, and this goes to zero, um, five, five nanoseconds later, that goes to a zero. Um, this is going to, this one here is going to be a zero. And for five nanoseconds, you're going to be in this state where you have a zero and zero. And then of course the original zero and zero from this inverted zero, because we're still waiting for this, uh, second inverter to, to happen due to the gate delay. Um, 
But oh, by the way, even though that's not a, st a stable state that we're in here, it's still outputting a zero, right? And so from the output perspective, uh, you see a constant zero in, in, in this state, which is good. Now, of course, we're going to have problems if in the reality that we did this in the middle of a clock pulse and one of these were actually at a one and, and it did just switch right in the middle of a clock pulse, you might get a zero. That's a rare, that's rare enough that um, I'm just going to ignore it. And in reality, what I usually have always done is I turn off the clock before I switch to program mode anyways. So, um, you know, so that that's not an issue that I'm going to try to solve for. This is, you know, switching from run to program mode um, is a frequent occurrence. And so if I can set things up where this 157 is in its, uh, in, is in the, you know, both zeros coming in in its rest state before I do the switch, um, I don't have to worry about a spurious pulse coming out of the, that I don't want coming out the thing. But that would require that I invert things a lot. So if you take a look at the, take a look at the, uh, da -da. Here we go. At the the design, you know, here's the actual. You know, let's put it this way. Um, here's the actual design of uh, the circuit design for things um, for the RAM module and what we're dealing with. Here's the, the LS seventy four LS one fifty seven. Here is the ANDed clock and RAM in signal going in, and here is the manual write signal going in. And of course, that's coming out. If instead we inverted this signal and then inverted this signal again and then switch this and let's pull this one let's pull this one low and then not put the have the switch uh, pull, uh, switch uh, in ground but instead switch in V you know five volts um, that would solve this right uh, that, that that would be exactly what I just, just described. Uh, in the with the logic diagram, but the question is, how am I going to get this inverted signal here? Um, well, it turns out uh, in the in the clock module we have this NAND gate here that that we were only using one gate in the in the original design, and as you know, any NAND gate can be turned into an inverter by you know just basically you know, if I turn this into a NAND gate and you know both uh, the single line goes into both inputs, it becomes effectively an inverter. So let's do that. Um, the, the, some of you may say, hey, you know, there was another problem that we had to fix. Uh, if you guys have been uh, following the, the Reddit forums, you know, some people were, have pointed out that this uh, RC circuit that Ben Eater originally designed had a problem. And the problem is the fact that, uh, well, it, it, you know, the, well, first, let's go over why he created this. You know, what we have is the clock signal coming in, something like that, right? Uh, and what we wanted for the RAM write signal to be a much shorter pulse than the clock signal. So what this RC circuit does here is basically takes on the rising edge of this clock, it takes the voltage up, but then it decays it down real quickly. And so you get a much shorter pulse going in the RAM write cir circuit, which is actually what we wanted. Um, but the problem was with this RC circuit is that it had a side effect and basically uh, it happened on the, the trailing edge of this uh, clock signal that when it got here, it, while it created this upward pulse, um, when it gets to the trailing edge, you know, by the nature of the way capacitors work, it created this negative pulse like that. And so what you end up getting was a clock signal that looked like that. And this negative pulse didn't go into the NAND gate. It actually back propagated into the clock line, which caused problems for other components. And so to solve that problem, you know, the, you, you basically have to isolate this clock line from the RC circuit. Um, to do that isolation, some people fed this clock line through this, uh, the extra gates uh, in the, in the, uh, the NAND IC uh, doubly, you know, just to twice invert it so that you get the same signal out again. Uh, but then that isolated a clock line from the, uh, isolates the clock line from the RC circuit. Uh, the, the, I didn't do that, and so I still have my gates. And I did isolate it, but instead of using the NAND gates, what I used to isolate it was a Schottky diode. Um, this is in fact what our Schottky diodes uh, are designed to be used for, is to isolate signal circuits in, in, in this manner. Um, 
And the benefit of a shocky diode over a normal diode is it has a low forward voltage, so it doesn't drop the signal very much. And it has a very fast switching time going from on to off, so it doesn't delay or interfere with the, the signal very much. And so um, the shocky diode, at least in my opinion, is a better solution to this problem than running through NAND gates. Though the NAND gates work too. I, I, it's just, um, just my choice. But uh, in order to solve both uh, LS LS uh, 74 LS 157 problem and this RC clock problem, my proposed, my solution is I, I use a Schottky diode on the clock line before it goes into the capacitor. And then I'm going to use the NAND, extra NAND gates on this uh, NAND chip in order to redesign such that the LS 157 has nothing, has it in its rest state, basically lows going into it and lows coming out. So that's my solution. Um, let's go ahead and implement this. Okay, now that we understand how it's fixed, how to fix it, uh, let's uh, go ahead and actually change things around in order to see if that actually fixes the problem. Um, by the way, you know, I did mention in design the, the fact that I'm using a shot key diode to uh, isolate the uh, clock signal from the RC circuit. Here is my shot key diode right there. You can see the clock circuit comes in here, the shot key diode uh, then isolates the clock line, and then I go through the RC circuit into this NAND gate. And so still, so I'm only using one of the NAND gates as originally designed, so I'm not using the other NAND gates to uh, isolate that clock signal as other people have done to fix that RC problem. Um, if you want to use my solution to fix the uh, LS157 problem, you would probably need to switch to uh, using the Shockey diode in order to uh, isolate the clock signal, and then thus you get the other NAND gate gates back to in order, order to solve this. Anyways, enough of that. Um, let's go ahead and uh, uh, fix this and then test things out. Um, let me pull out the old wires uh, to that solve this. Uh, let's pull out this old signal wire right there. Okay, there, we have it all together now. Um, let's test this out. Let's program in another memory pattern to this. There we go, uh, clearly that's working. Um, and now let's uh, switch between the two. Yep, usually by now I have had, I would lose the uh, RAM to a ground pulse and it would seem that we have solved this problem now. And now I can switch between run and program without uh, without losing my uh, without losing my uh, RAM contents, uh, whatever address I'm on. So great, this is working now. So there you go. That that that's the solution to at least the solution I implemented for the LS157 uh, toggle problem. Um, certainly, you can replicate it. Uh, the ego-eyed among you might notice that my control logic down here uh, at the bottom of my computer is different than what uh, Ben Eater originally implements. I did implement originally what Ben Eater implemented, and then I have these grand plans of adding more modules to this computer. And the first thing I realized is that I needed more control lines, and so I designed a uh, I designed a whole new control logic uh, implementation that uses three EEPROMs and some. Um, 74 HCT 238s in order to kind of expand them a little bit more. I will be posting more information about that in the future. Uh, for now, I'm still kind of wor working out some uh, minor issues and when I have it all posted or ready to go, I will post more about that. Thanks for watching and uh, certainly put any comments uh, down below if you have any questions about what I did here.